morning. This is not Chemistry 1. If you're expecting Chemistry 1, you should be somewhere else. This will be New York City, a social history. I'm Danny Walkowitz. I'm a professor of history and of social and cultural analysis. And uh, I'm going to entertain you, or hopefully you will, we will entertain one another for the next three months through early, early May. There are copies of the syllabus up front. And I will suggest that we have these passed out. They are also online on Blackboard. But by passing them out, we have a chance to go over some of the details in them. I'll take one. The music that you were hearing at the opening of the class was not New York, New York. That's quite deliberate. It actually is from a CD called New York City, The Global Beat. It was a Romanian cola, the kind of music that is familiar to the ethnic Romanian community of Queens. So if you were to go out there, in fact, that is also New York City's music. And the point of this exercise is simply to open up our minds to hearing the social history of New York through its music. We'll also experience it, hopefully, through the built environment and through a range of other kinds of media during the course of the semester. In fact, every class will begin with period music, and we will slowly move ourselves from the 17th century right through the 20th century. But it will be music of the street, music of the music hall, music of the dance hall. It will be music that speaks to the different social experiences of the social and ethnic classes of New York City as they were expressing themselves through their music. And in dancing to the music, expressing themselves through their bodies. And I will, during the course of the semester, also try to give you some sense of that as well, only because it's one of my abiding passions, uh, recreational as well as professional. So we'll occasionally talk about how dance changes over the course of the 20th century, how film changes, how media changes, how music changes, but we'll also be talking about the cultures of the peoples of the city of New York. This class is going to be podcasted. It is part of an experiment that NYU is embarking on with the Media Center and with IT. And there will be three different kinds of experiences that they're piloting. This is one of the three. This one is audio. So you don't have to worry about not having your makeup on on any, any given day or having a bad hair day or having dressed shabbily. No one will know. Just you and your hairdresser and all your neighbors and friends. Okay? Your voice will occasionally be captured. So if any of you have problems with that, you need to identify yourselves and let us know. Otherwise, we will presume that you do not mind having your voice captured any more than I do. Indeed, on the whole, uh, this will not be discussion sections. You will meet those separately. There will be occasions when I'll ask for some feedback. And I'm guessing there'll be occasions when you want to give me some feedback. And both of those will be opportunities to hear your voices. But on the whole, that's not going to be your experience here. Okay? Are there any questions about that that you want to have? Again, it's a pilot. It's open coursework. So in fact, if NYU moves forward with it down the road, as I expect they will, it will all be f free material. For this semester, that this material will not be put up online for anyone to hear other than for me to edit it and begin to hear it down as we proceed March, April, I may decide that in fact it ain't too shabby and we'll put some of it up. But my guess is it's not, it is not meant to be an alternative to lecture. 
It is meant to be an opportunity for you to rehear things that may have been muddled, but it is primarily going to be meant to be for people uh, living in the boonies who want to pick up a course on the history of New York City or other courses to be able to download these from NYU professors as they can presently from MIT and from many other of the more distinguished universities in the country. So NYU is kind of piloting and playing with this. It will be all free material and there are copyright issues that we'll be dealing with. You're going to see some images today for which they will have to deal with copyright. Okay, But on the whole, that's not a concern of yours for today. Did you have a question? No. Okay. So down the road, we'll, we'll experiment with putting some of this up on the web, but for now, we won't. Every class will also begin with an image. This is fragment one. It will be part of a game for which you can receive a boost in academic credit, but it is not required of anyone. It is meant to try to get you to see the past in the city in ways in which you may not have been used to doing. It's to create a kind of visual literacy. So it will be a fragment game. There will be six images in the first six lectures, and you will be invited to identify them by giving me a sense of the fragment's past use, its present use, and its location. This is meant to be a pretty easy one, and indeed, Fragment game one comes from Chelsea. All the fragments are from Chelsea. To successfully complete the game and win the grand prize, which is in addition to a point boost in your grade, is a, um, to be a surprise. <laughs> you are required to not simply identify these six fragments, but you are to bring in as part of your submission, two fragments that you find on your own for the area. It means you've got to walk the streets with a camera. It could be you know, a digital, it can be your smartphone, however you want to do it. It doesn't have to be very high resolution. And along the lines, that's to say, find something that reads the past in the present and identify it for us. Give us a couple of your fragments. OK, any questions about that? This is the first. It's Chelsea. Easy enough to find. It's the Ladies Mile. Some housekeeping details, if we may. First of all, there are discussion sections. And you have some adjunct instructors who will be running those discussion sections. At, and you're expected to meet them, meet with them once a week. The three discussion section leaders are here. Michelle Stanley, you will know. David Weinfield, is David here? In the back, far back on the left. And Nathan Marcus, also in the back. Okay. Those discussion sections are required. Very hard to have discussion if you're not there to talk. All of those sections are on Blackboard as well. And the discussion leaders are invited and I'm guessing will encourage you to participate in that discussion through, Black, through the use of Blackboard. Is this NYC social history? It is. Would you like to join us? Please take a seat. From the syllabus, you will notice it discusses these discussion sections at the beginning and suggests that 25% of the final grade will be based on it. It notes, it notes as well the rest of the grading. A substantial part of that grading will be written work that you do in terms of papers and exams. There will be a midterm exam and a final exam. The midterm exam will include some short answer identifications really to give you a way of having some confidence by midterm that you're picking up what seem to be the salient events and figures that we'll be talking about during the semester. Okay? And then there'll be some short, there'll be some essays. Okay? 
I'm not terribly interested in factoids. So you don't have to know that the War of 1812 occurred in 1812. But it would be helpful if you knew it wasn't in the middle of the 19th century. As it happens, I expect that you'll know the War of 1812 was in 1812. That one's easy. But I do expect, so you don't have to miss, but, but if you're concerned about factoids, and indeed you have to have evidence to support your arguments, I don't want you to have to write them on your palm. So you will be invited to bring in a 3 by 5 card with every factoid that obsesses you written on it to the exam. Okay? That is the evidence that you often will want to use to mobilize for your arguments. It's your arguments that are going to concern us about the past. Yes? Um, of course. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make you buy them otherwise, but you will notice that Gotham, I've only, I'm not requiring that you read all of it. If you look at the syllabus, um, you'll see that only excerpts have been chosen from Gotham. Okay. You've been... Well, then you don't have to worry about it. You've already read it. <laughs> well, you, you, you see, one of the unusual things in life, you've been given a second chance. In, indeed, in this particular case, I've not assigned all of that either. I've assigned a middle section of that particular book and some excerpts to read. Okay? For the final exam, you will receive all the questions in advance for review. There will be, I will give you roughly 10 review questions two weeks before the final. And we will choose probably three of those for the final in which you will answer two or we'll choose four and you'll answer three. Okay. But you will have had those questions in advance. And on that occasion as well, you need not write on your palm. You will be invited again to bring in a three by five card with every factoid that you can cram onto it. Okay. Those are the exams. The other part are the papers. And we'll take another occasion to talk about those as the class develops. There is a discussion of them there. There's the first paper is meant to be the shorter one. It's six pages long. And it's on social po a social policy during the decade in which your grandparent was born in New York, for New York City. So if you're a woman, it's the grandmother on your mother's side. If you're a man, it's the father on your grandfather on your father's side, just so there's a consistent rule. And I know in many cases they weren't born in New York, but come to New York and look and see what that decade was like. Okay, that's what that project is. The second project, the second paper, which is a longer one, as you'll see, will be approved by your section instructor. We'll have a chance to talk about that later. It'll be later in the semester. Okay. The major concern I would have about all of these, as you understand, is that there are rules about plagiarism. On the whole, I have not found plagiarism, deliberate plagiarism, as much of a problem as inadvertent plagiarism. But both are as serious as the uh, one as the other. That's to say, you need to understand that if you are borrowing ideas from someone else, they are not yours. You must credit them. We have a very nice process for doing that, a notation method. It's called a footnote. And you can be generous in acknowledging the smart folks you've read for other ideas. It doesn't make your work any less interesting or distinguished to know that you found smart ideas from other people. So it's not simply things you've quoted. Okay? And on the whole, you are not expected to quote from secondary sources unless you're debating with them anyway. The general rule of thumb is that put it in your own words. So be very careful when you're taking notes that you're not simply taking notes word for word and not putting quote marks so you don't realize what they are. And it's fairly easy. We do a web search for that. What if your word happens to coincide with somebody else's That's called plagiarism. Make sure they don't. That's not fair. Hmm? That's not fair. Uh, it's, it's been very rare that they inadvertently coincide. If they coincide in a, ser in a serious row of words, it's, it, the, the chances of that happening are infinitesimal. I wouldn't worry about it. 
if that indeed happens in your case, you'll have, it'll have to be adjudicated, and we'll see the, we'll see the circumstances. Okay. Any other questions about plagiarism? Yes. Your um, adjunct instructor. Okay. Food. I ask that you not bring it to class. You can bring a drink if you'd like. Lunchtime, coffee, whatever. I'd rather that you not bring crinkly things in. It's a little like the movies. Just think about the rules around the movies. But I'd rather that you not bring in sandwiches. I salivate and I get hungry. So it just, just uh, as a general courtesy, don't bring food in. And I'm asking that we turn off all of our phones. Yes? Turn them off. and no laptop computers in class. I've always allowed it in the past, but I've discovered that students have come in and com <clears throat> have complained that they find it distracting when people are watching video on Facebook or doing their email and other kinds of things. And in fact, I find, so I'm asking simply that there, there, that there not be uh, computers in the classroom as well. And finally, late work. Obviously, if you're sick, you can get extensions. Bring in a note from the doctor. Okay? Give it to your instructor. Otherwise, the work will be due on the day that it's assigned. Okay? Late work will not be accepted without permission from your instructor. Um, and that should be really based on medical issues. Midterm final exam, if your parents schedule you for a trip to the Caribbean, explain to your parents that you have an exam. Okay? That, is not a, that is not a satisfactory reason to miss an exam, that your parents have, have arranged for you to be someplace else. Okay? okay, so much for the silliness that we have to go through. My office is located at 20 Cooper Square. And I will be there for formal office hours on, I think, Monday and Wednesday afternoon from 2 to 3 o'clock. I tend to be there a lot because I'm the director of undergraduate studies, and I'm also a director of experiential education for the college. So I'm often around. So you can email me if need be, or preferably just make an appointment to see me after class if need be. My office is, I'm always available to answer any questions you might have, okay, at any time. There will be also three walking tours that I've organized for the class. They are on, I believe, Saturday mornings. They are completely voluntary. They are just something I offer to those students who would like to get another way, another way of looking at the city. The first will be at the beginning of March. Tends to be brisk, but the weather usually has broken. It's not too bad. And uh, the second will be at the end of March, early April, and the third will be in the beginning, uh, the, at the very end of the semester. They will take us into Brooklyn, into Queens, and the different parts of Manhattan. More about that again later uh, for those who are interested. So any questions so far? Three walks all together. Three walks all together. There are articles that I've posted on Blackboard. They're already up on Blackboard. You are expected to download those articles, have individual copies of them, available for you when you go to discussion section so that you can talk about them. Okay? Each person must download their own. That has to do with copyright laws. Okay? So please, please do so. The alternative was I went to a copy shop and ordered them last year, and it cost everybody 50 bucks a head. So this is, in my mind, a far better solution. Okay. OK, will everyone please take out a piece of paper, plain piece of paper, and draw a map of New York City.
No names on it. And then in a corner someplace, list for me the names of five prominent New Yorkers or, or people that you associate with the history of New York City. This is not, not a test. Nathan, David, Michelle, you want to collect those for me, please? Just bring them up front. So here we, ha here we have one, okay? Um, well, what do you think? What do you notice? Long Island's pretty big. Long Island's, Long Island's well... Well, Manhattan looks actually like, like an organ from a body. I'm afraid. <laughs> kind of attached. It's a little attached there, isn't it? Okay. Doesn't, it, it, isn't, it isn't an island at all, okay, necessarily. But there at least are, there are five boroughs. All right. That's one thing that's useful. We have here, we have a sense that Brooklyn and Queens are attached to one another and that they move out to Long Island. The figures that are listed are Brooke Astor, Bernie Madoff, Giuliani, Frick, and Rockefeller. Um, well, what do you no what do you th notice about those folks? Money. money, money, yes, indeed. Let's just see what else we have here. Is and rotate, rotate, rotate. This is fun. OK. Um, again, a little harder to see here in terms of what they are, but you get a sense again that there's uh, this is over here is meant to be Roosevelt Island. We're told this is Brooklyn and Long Island. Uh, the Bronx is up here, contiguous with Manhattan. It doesn't seem to have there doesn't seem to be much of an island there, but we do have a little island off here. I have no idea. I guess this must be. Um, America, <laughs> right? Otherwise known as New Jersey, or right, or or I, as I think of it, is the West. Right? <laughs> and then um, there's there there is no Queens, and I'm not sure we see Staten Island. But again, we have a sense of where we are. The figures that are listed: Bloomberg, Frank Sinatra. I know. Well. Interesting idea. Don't, don't, don't think it isn't New York, necessarily. 50 cents. <laughs> Giuliani and Andy Warhol. Okay. And let's see. Oh, here's. The Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn all kind of pull, pull together. There's, again, remember this, most of you know Long Island is actually the, the western end of Long Island is Bronx and Queens, and the mainland of the, United, of the rest of the United States is the Bronx. And then there's this thing called New Manhattan, which is an island. And then um, well, we have Staten Island located down here. And then we have, we're okay, thank you though, appreciate it. And then we have various parts 
that are identified. Lower Manhattan, Soho, the East Village, Central Park, Harlem, Inwood, Washington Heights, the UWS, Upper West Side, and the Upper East Side. So we have regions that are identified, we'll come back to that again. And then the major figures, Moses, Robert Moses, Hillary Clinton, Kristen Gillibrand, Rudolph Giuliani, Michael Bloomberg. Again, any observations? All right, political figures. Uh, one of the differences here, at least, we're seeing two of them are women. Okay? Generally, our political figures tend to be male men in most of these context, in most of these contexts. All right, let's turn this off and let's go back to where we are, which is. Uh, Bravo. Well, the issue in part for us, of course, in studying social history of New York City, and it'll be something that you'll talk about hopefully in these first discussion sections, is what is social history? And then secondly, what is New York City? What are its boundaries? How do we understand it? The first exercise is something that we call cognitive mapping. Cognitive mapping. It comes from the work of a man named Kevin Lynch, L-Y-N-C-H, who writes, wrote in 1966, and tried to describe the ways in which, in fact, people often imagine places and map them. And there are visual representations of those maps. You've given us one. Can anybody else think of a familiar visual representation that you see all the time and work with of New York City? The subway maps, okay? And I'll show you a few subway maps, but you would do the same thing if you were to go to any other city. How many of you, after all, have been to London? Okay? And you've seen the subway map there, the underground map. Is that a physical representation of the city? So some maps can actually be organized so that you would actually know the distance between places, or rather, they take it symbolically and try to organize the map just so that they can show you every place, on, all the subway stations on it. So they, they often serve different purposes at different moments of time, but they are imaginings about a place okay, for different purposes. What's interested, interesting to us is what's made legible in these different kinds of maps. That's to say, first of all, what are the landmarks? What are people choosing to identify? So on your maps, everyone chose some kinds of landmarks. Sometimes it was simply boroughs. That was a landmark for you. That was the way in which the city was identified around these political spaces. That's all a borough is, after all. Okay. For others, it was around Internal spaces, Central Park becomes a landmark that you want to, that you identify with. Okay? Indeed, one of the things that distinguishes New York City from lots of other cities are the number of landmarks we associate with it. If you had to think of a landmark for Paris, what would you think of? Tower. Eiffel Tower. Anything else? Oh, what else? I couldn't hear. Montmartre. Anyone else? The Arctic. Arc de Triomphe and Bussy, okay? If you came to London? Tower of London. Big Ben. Big ben. Now the Ferris wheel, okay? A series of things. But you notice I've heard very few. And what about New York? Chrysler build, Building, Empire State, Rockefeller Center, Statue of Liberty. Central Park. What about, what about streets? Wall Street, Fifth Avenue, Madison Avenue, Park Avenue, Broadway, 42nd Street. And first of all, where are all those streets? A, they're in Manhattan. That's to say they're often in certain districts. The second thing is New York, more than almost any place, has legions of places that are in fact identified with the city that you could mention. And many of them are in fact street names. Not Think of how few of the other places we talked about are actually street names in other places. 
you could press yourself and you'd think of some. And in certain decades, some would be more prominent than others. So some of you would have thought if we were in the 60s or 70s, Carnaby Street would be important in London. It's less so today. Okay? But in terms of fashion and the Beatles, it was important in the 60s. But New York has vast numbers of places that are landmarks that you might well identify with the city. So what's interesting here is in your mapping, you've chosen to identify some places rather than others. Districts, pathways would be discovered. So some of you, if you had had to draw pathways, they would be their rivers, okay? their seas, the Hudson River, the East River become pathways. For many people, a pathway through Manhattan would be Broadway. Okay? Because it has, it's one of the few avenues that navigates from the very beginning all the way to the top of the city okay? without being cut off by the park or by the, growth, by the narrowing and widening of the, of the, of the island. Okay? So there are pathways that you might notice as well. But finally, and as important, it seems to me, are what you think to be the boundaries. If you were being asked to do this in 1640, you'd have a very different sense of New York. It wouldn't even have had that name. But in 1800, 1850 even, how would it have been different? Well, Brooklyn was a separate city. So man, New York was just Manhattan. Okay? It has changed its political boundaries. What about New York as a metropolis? What about New York as, a, as an imagined place? How many of you, after all, were traveling to an NYU campus in Shanghai or in Ghana or in Paris, and people say, where are you from? And you say, oh, I'm from NYU or I'm from New York. But in fact, if pressed, you're actually from New Jersey. Okay. Or you're from Westchester. But indeed, what are your local television stations? They're two, four, five, seven. They're the New York stations. What are the, what are the local newspapers of record that you read? Whether it's the New York Post, the New York Daily News, the New York Times. Okay. And they're papers that have a reach that's different than before. So many of the places we imagine as New York change their boundaries and in part as cultural boundaries versus political boundaries versus tax boundaries. The culture, as it's changed in the 20th century, has made New York a different place in the 20th century than it was in the 17th, in the 18th, and the 19th centuries. Classic case in point, what is a the New York as a metropolis? If you were to look at the metropolitan New York region, or what is metrop metropolitan New York, including, by the way, questions about where to place its airports, where to have its triborough authority, or what it was to integrate, you would have found that prior to World War II, the areas in northern New Jersey were its own metropolitan district. So the area around Patterson, does anyone know where Patterson is? Where is Patterson? In North Jersey. Okay, North Jersey. It is basically 11 miles west on Route 4 from the George Washington Bridge. Okay? It's an old industrial city. Okay? It was one of the first great American industrial cities. It has a national park as the birthplace now of the American Industrial Revolution. Alexander Hamilton imagined his plan for manufacturing based on Patterson, where there was a waterfall that would generate water power. So it had many old industrial plants. From Colt, people who made the revolver, to Baldwin locomotives, to becoming the Silk City with all the silk industry. Passaic, a neighboring city, Patterson and Clifton, were a metropolitan district. Today, if you go to the Census Bureau and look at it's metropolitan districts. That district no longer exists. It is now absorbed into the New York metropolitan district. 
So Frank Sinatra may not be such a strange choice after all if we're thinking about what constitutes the imagining of New York and singing New York, New York, or other kinds of songs. Okay? So that today, in fact, people who work in New York, commute to New York, get their news from New York, come in for its nightlife, may be living, or in fact work as the policeman, work as the fireman, as New York's finest. Live in a place called New York in Dutchess County, or in New Jersey, or in Long Island, where they, have a, where they can afford to live, among other things. So the notion of boundaries has changed. You showed me boundaries. And what's striking is how much political life determined your boundaries. And those, by the way, were boundaries that were largely established in the 18th century. It's one of the ways in which New York is different than other cities. If Phoenix doesn't like its boundaries and people move to the suburbs, what does Phoenix do? It annexes them. Let's annex Patterson. Maybe not too many non-white people there. That might be how some people are thinking. Or not much of a tax base. Too many expenses. Well, but let's, how about maybe Scarsdale? Or how about some of the rich suburbs in Nassau County? No longer possible. Because of political power, among other kinds of things. New York ceases to annex okay, at the end of the 19th century. It makes the difference between old cities and new cities. The new cities in the Sun Belt freely annex other places all the time and continue to expand. They can change the tax formula. Here, New Jersey and Connecticut can compete for industry and simply try to attract industries out of Manhattan. Move across the river, we'll charge you less. Move Wall Street to Newark. We'll charge you less. Well, the answer in Phoenix was to annex, and then they lose that advantage. Here, New York has very different sets of problems that are a function of its geography and its history. They are not necessarily like every, it is not necessarily like every other city. So when we study New York, we're going to be studying a city that's largely been shaped by its history and its past and bears some resemblances to other industrial cities in the Rust Belt. Well, I'm not quite sure, for sure that could be said, but, I, but that would need to be filled out as to how they're shaped by it. Every place is shaped by its relationships. That's why we think of it as a, metro, as a metropolis. Okay. The question really is to figure out how it's shaped by those places and how it's shaped differently over time by those places and how it may be shaped differently than other places are shaped by its nearby neighbors. And that's what we'll try to uncover over the course of the semester. Well, I traveled to, Boston, uh, to London in 1972 and discovered that I was living with friends and others in which uh, there wasn't always central heating and there wasn't always indoor plumbing. And in America, we had, in the United States, a much higher standard of living. It was nicer. On the other hand, I also discovered that I walked the streets. I wasn't looking behind me all the time. And it creates a notion as to what constitutes better. D.H. Lawrence described America as the leader in world salvation and indoor plumbing. <laughs> and that's one way in which people think about better. And the point only is that different places think about it and peoples think about it in different ways. And we'll need to engage that. 
We see as well in the images, in the, in the notations as to the major figures that you've talked about, the dominance of male and white figures as part of the political legacy of the city. How would the story, however, of New York be told differently if it's told from the perspective of the people who don't always win? That's to say, from the, how is the story differently as told by losers? History is a tale generally written by winners. How would the story of America be told if it was told by Native Americans? How would the story of the South, how is it different when it's told through the voices and perspective of African-American slaves rather than from slave owners. We want to hear all of those voices, but we want to think also about who has had the power and has the power to have their perspectives authorized, their voices heard, and whose voices don't get heard. And one of the things that makes social history different is that it tries to empower, has tried historically since mid-century, to empower voices from the bottom up, not just from the top down. So it doesn't become simply Bloomberg, Giuliani, <coughs> Koch, or the other wealthy voices that you listed perspectives. We want to hear those as well, but we also want to hear the perspectives of everyone else. Indeed, could you have had a social history of New York City written in the 17th century, in the 18th century, in the 19th century? History as a discipline was largely professionalized in the 1880s and 1890s. On the whole, it was a political narrative that was told. If you had to read a history of New York City written in 1876 for the, bicent for the centennial, what do you think those history that history would have looked like? if you had read such a history for any city in which you grew up. Where'd you grow up? Uh, Michigan. Michigan. Detroit will take as a city. Okay. If you had read the centennial history of Detroit, where'd you grow up? Connecticut. Connecticut. If you had read the centennial history of Hartford, where'd you grow up? West Palm Beach. Centennial history of Miami Beach didn't have one necessarily. It's a whole new kind of history. But if you had read the centennial histories, what do you think was in those histories? What do you think dominated those stories? They were stories of the great men who made cities. Okay. The chapters were organized about when the banks were built. They were organized around whether the major manufacturers were built. They listed the major mayors. They listed the, ma the, the police chiefs. And the chapters detailed the great fires that destroyed the city and then the new people who came in with capital to rebuild the cities. Their effort was, in, their in fact, were dominated by what we might call boosterism because they wanted to make clear to everybody why their city was great and indeed why you ought to want to move there, why you want to move to that city and you want to set up house there. That was their objective. And our narratives coming into the 20th century were primarily political narratives. They were stories about great white men in power, the history of the presidency, the history of the Senate, great pieces of legislation. One of the things that changed in the middle of the 1960s was the emergence of something that hopefully you will talk a little bit about in your discussion section. It was called the new social history. So there was a social history earlier it would have been the history of religion. It would have been the growth of libraries, the growth of schools. You would have heard about the development of settlement houses. What changes in the 1960s is something called the new social history, and it changes because people like you suddenly are in classrooms. What would this classroom have looked like in the 1950s, well, forget that this room wasn't here, what would an NYU classroom or a classroom in a major American university, Harvard, Yale, or any place else have looked like? White guys. White guys. Okay. Anything else? 
rich white guys. So many of you would not have been here. Okay? Many of us would not have been there. It changes in the 60s and changes dramatically. Public education opens up. The state universities expand dramatically. It begins expanding, by the way, after World War II. Why? The GI Bill. Okay? And takes off in the early 60s. And one of the things that happens is that the new people in the classroom start to say, I want to, why aren't I part of that history? Don't I matter? How does my story matter? One of the departments in which I hold my tenure and help, I was involved, I'm proud to say, in the formation of this department is called social and cultural analysis. It is an amalgamation of five or six programs at the university, none of which existed prior to 1965 did not exist at all. What are they? Africana studies. In most places, they form in that, in that period in the early 70s as African American studies and then Africana studies. Metropolitan studies was organized as urban studies. Didn't exist in colleges prior to 1968. Latino studies, new even at NYU. Gender and sexuality studies. The women's movement takes off with second wave feminism in the 1970s. There are no women's studies programs at universities. Or programs dealing with sexuality. Gay and queer studies. Asian Pacific American studies, entirely new. In part, all of that becomes now the new stuff of my other home of history. Historians now start asking, how does it matter when we're asking about the experience of the African American? How does it matter that we're now asking about the experience of Asian Pacific Americans, of the Chinese in America, of the Koreans in America, of the Japanese in America? From their perspective, not just from them that are interning them, but their voices. And what too of the experience of Latinos, who now are the majority of American cities. And how do we understand those voices? How do we understand it that some of those people find ready access to America if they come from Cuba, but not if they come from Haiti in the past? Hmm, that's interesting today and worth asking about as we'll move forward. All of that becomes the new stuff of a social history of New York City, only it means that we also open up the past about those experiences, the peoples of New York. And we begin to ask, how does the narrative, the story of the great growth of this major citadel to American capitalism, how do we understand that story if it's not just the story of Andrew Carnegie, Rockefeller, Bloomberg, but also becomes the story of the working people of the city and the wages that they got and the struggles that they fought. So the intention, or what we've seen in the writing of much of this social history, is a different version of the past begins to emerge. Not one that denies the validity of the one before, but suggests a more complex, a more complicated story with multiple voices and different kinds of power. To simply say everybody has power doesn't often acknowledge that some people with million dollars in their pockets have more access to power than some people with less money, as in the ability to control or to own their own television station and their news stations. So we'll need to think about that over time. And that's going to be part of the project of the next few weeks. It involved participant observation by living in communities by people who went through the sociology department at the University of Chicago at the turn of the 20th century. And it began to presume that every city maybe looked like Chicago 
or every experience could be like Chicago. So a second model began to appear that we know that we associate with Los Angeles. And some of you will have read about that in other courses. The person perhaps best associated with the Chicago school, it's suburbanized as a city, decentered with class enclaves and gated communities. And that's a second model. Well, New York offers us yet a very distinct and third model that doesn't build on those entirely. For one, New York is a port city. It is a capital city, and it is a global city. In many respects, it bears more comparison, I would argue, with London than it does with any other American city. as a global city for capital, as a port city, and as a kind of capital. It's a place with financial capital and cultural capital, but unlike London, the political capital, was, which was occasionally in New York for the first century and a half, moves increasingly, you know, to Washington, which lives under the illusion that it is the capital. You'll learn not to take everything I say seriously, or entirely seriously. So New York is what I would argue the model of what we might now call the cosmopolitan metropolis. Its form of industrialization is different than in other cities, more like London than the famous factory cities of America. If you thought about industrialization in the 19th century, you would have studied Lowell, Massachusetts, Lawrence, Massachusetts, Patterson, New Jersey. Okay? In London, in England, you would have studied not London, you would have studied what? Manchester. Manchester or Liverpool. Okay? What we study instead argues is not to say that New York doesn't have industrialization. It has a different form of it and it allows us to rethink the character of industrialization, that it isn't simply associated with big factories. It could be associated with outwork. It could be associated with changed social relations of production. We'll talk about those words later. It's gonna talk about people working often, not just with machines, but with their hands, but, with, but for a wage, not on a barter system as they would have in the 18th century. It is going to talk about the, pro the prominence and the penetration of what we would call the emergence of a market economy. And that will be central to New York. And it will talk about New York as part of not just a metropolis, a place that relates to not just Edgewater, New Jersey, but the hinterlands beyond that, but to a global network for both capital and labor and goods. And if you don't believe that, everyone look at the label of the person sitting in front of you and see where the shirt was made. And very few of you will find that it was made in New York, though it may have all been purchased in New York. Okay? And that's changed over time. But they are a part of our story too. For New York is a place, however, of two very divergent things that we want to try to reconcile over the course of the semester. The first, when we think of New York, we think of a place of unbridled wealth. And it's a place that's famous for many of us in song and in movies, Tiffany's. Think of some of the great movies that were made about New York, coming to New York to make it. Right? Not just Breakfast at Tiffany's, okay? 42nd Street, or all the other kinds of movies that have people, young girls and boys, coming to New York City in order to find stardom and make it. It's still the dream that animates young women and young men, in some cases, to come to NYU, I guess. To be at the center, especially if you want to be in fashion, 
You want to be in the theater. You want to be at the center of media, whether it's print media or whether it's, journal, print, whether it's journalism. So New York is a place of unbridled opportunity and success. That's to say, the American dream, as it's imagined, is sometimes realized in New York for people. The Horatio Alger myth has, like all myths, a kernel of reality. Andrew Carnegie did rise from rags to riches. We know that most Americans went from rags to the grave. Most people can't go to riches, can't have everybody rich. But a few did, and where better was that imagined than in New York? The other side to that, however, of course, is poverty. So it's not just Wall Street, it's not just fashion, media, Time, Newsweek, NBC, ABC, CBS, Wall Street Journal. It is also a place of danger. Pelham 123. Think of the images of Spider-Man movies in Gotham. It is a place that could be seen as anomic and cavernous. Think of the images of films like Metropolis or The Matrix or the Batman movies and those images of New York, all of which are Gotham. It could be a place of backwardness. Think of the rube that was made popular in the 70s, not for Manhattan, but thought to be therefore in Queens, a very particular class marker, an ethnic commentary, Archie Bunker. Some of you will remember, or at least have seen reruns. And of course, it is a place that is identified with poverty and danger. Historically, the imaging of Harlem, not just around the, around the later Harlem Renaissance, but the earlier imaginings as well as imaginings in the 60s, it was a code word for the rest of the world. The Lower East Side as a code word for a kind of dense poverty that was unequaled except maybe in the East End of London Dickens traveled between both and commented on their similarity, as we'll see when we get to the 1830s. And indeed, in the, 19, in the 2000 census, Manhattan was the first number one county in America for inequality. We had greater inequality in Manhattan than any other county in America. We were number two in 1990 because there was a county in Hawaii that had a leper colony. They closed the leper colony, so we beat them out by 2000. <laughs> so that's also a story we need to understand. How do we allow that to happen? How do we tolerate it? Or how do we celebrate it? Or do people do all of those? Or how do we make it visible? Or how is it somehow invisible? Which parts of that story get told, and how does that happen? So part of our history is to get to the present to understand, is that just now, or were the seeds of that much earlier? And is there a relationship between the two? Is the wealth dependent in some way on the poverty, or are they independent variables? Probably not. Not entirely, of course. So what is New York? Let me show you a few other images of the city. The New Yorker cartoon from 1976. At this, okay. The New Yorker's view of the world. Not unlike your own, though here what's telling, of course, the New Yorker's view I always explain to my, to my students that uh, the West begins around Paramus, New Jersey. And you can see that's the New Yorker's view of the world, okay. roughly there. Ninth Avenue, 10th Avenue, and then the rest, and a small little piece. Okay. That's occurring, however, at the same time that people like Gerald Ford, when being asked to deal with a bailout for New York, which was having financial crisis, about which we will learn much later in the semester, his Remember the response, 
as at least mirrored in a headline in the, one of the New York tabloids was Drop Dead New York. No money was to be forthcoming. How is New York imagined from the rest of the world? Here's New Yorkistan from December 2001 after 9-11. This is the Middle Easterns comedy, a, a comedic view as a, the New Yorker would have it, of what New York might look like from there. So Wall Street becomes moolahs. Okay. What does Greenwich Village become? Your home? Kooks, K-H-O-U-K-S. Okay. Go across the river. Where are we? Par Brooklyn. Where, where in Brooklyn? No. Park Slope. Brooklyn. Brooklyn Heights. Brooklyn Heights. Fatushis. <laughs> Fatushis. Okay. You get the idea, I think. Here's Flatbushtons, Lubavishton, Kvechnia. <laughs> A kind of a mixture of you know, a lot of Yiddish through, thro thrown in through some of this, as you can see. Botoxia, one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. So a wonderful kind of cartoon imagining of the world. And it's helpful just to remember that we imagine ourselves in some ways, but our history is as much tied up with the ways in which other people are imagining us and imagining our experience. And that may mean that they think of it as opportunity. I can go there and have a fat tushy. Or that's to say, make a lot of money, live the fat and easy life. Opportunity. Or they could see it as a scary place of exploitation that they want to send a plane into one of its buildings. Okay. So it's useful to remember that imaginings, A, we can't control how other people imagine us. And it shapes how they arrive. They could arrive by boat in Ellis Island. They could arrive by plane at JFK. Or they could arrive by plane in other ways that are less fond to remember. They all involve their imaginings about us. And we need to understand that. They involve their notions of our boundaries, of our landmarks, of what New York represents of our sense of our, of our social life, of our class position in the world, of our ethnicity, of our religion, or from their, someone's perspective, maybe lack of religion, that we're all secular, doomed to go to hell. All of that is caught up with how we live our lives and how people come here. Two other final Imaginings. Here's the New York City subway from 1959. What do you note about that compared to the present subway map? The boroughs don't seem to be distinct. Right. Okay. Very little sense. Hard to quite imagine the city from this in quite, in quite its way. It's actually laid out to simply allow the, the subway lines to be shown. It has very little relationship to the actual shape. It has a limited, a, a, less, a less defined relationship to the city than it did earlier. Yes? Are any of these lines not anymore? You know, I can't see it well enough to be able to tell. They're, they're always closing and opening lines, but by and large, most lines didn't close. It's only recently, and as you know now, with projected layoffs that they're thinking of closing down some lines. But no, these lines, the only lines that get closed are elevated lines, and they're closing right around that time. So elevated lines are being closed for subway lines, but we'll, and we'll talk about some of that later. Yes, in the back? On the current map, it is, it, Manhattan is the center because that map is actually meant for tourists and for where, where most of the traffic is. That's right, I'm guessing. Here's a 1968 map, more similar to what you see today. More similar to what you see today, made by Calgano. And again, the use of color begins to change. 
it marks the different lines in different kinds of colors. And to this day, there are people who understand the lines in different ways. So you can be traveling with someone and they'll say, oh, where do I go to get the ladies' mile? And someone will say, oh, it's on Avenue of the Americas. And someone else will say it's on Sixth Avenue. And it's not clear that everyone will understand those to be the same places. Right? The same thing would be true if somebody said, take the green line. Anybody say here, take the green line? No, of course not. But what do you say? You use letters now. But some older timers would have said, oh, it's the IRT. Okay? Take, the old I take the IRT. I know people from an older generation, that's how they'll still relate to some of those lines. <coughs> some of that change. We'll talk about that kind of history as well. But again, you see the physicality. Again, we do have now a separate marking. Pretty much, um, Manhattan is not, again, is not as central as it is in the same map. Any other comments or questions? Okay. By the 50s, the New York metropolitan area included all the adjacent counties. And today it stretches, as I've said earlier, across Pennsylvania, New Jersey. If you were to look at a similar subway map of, New of London today, the subway map in London includes the, the reach of the lines outside the city. We don't do that. Okay? But there would be every reason now to increasingly have a line that includes Metro North, that includes the path lines into New Jersey, and integrate them into these kinds of maps. I'm guessing that's the map of the next decade that will come, that really integrates the various lines into the city because it will reflect, in fact, the actual use that people are making in the city. As every schoolboy and schoolgirl knows, however, the story of New York generally begins with a rather clever purchase of Manhattan Island for $64. We will attend to the power of this myth later. For the history of the land, as we know, well precedes this seeming fact, which we know by and large to be erroneous. The land was settled first by others, and it was settled well before the Dutch arrived. And our story properly begins with the history of the Lenape Indians, though in truth they were the second to arrive. The first who came will be made apparent when you show up next Monday. We'll resume our story. <laughs>